Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We are on time. As we advertised, we'd be live at 11.15, and we are. Pray for us, Facebook audience, YouTube audience. We are still looking for a place. We're meeting in the hotel conference room of the Quality Inn and Suites in Thomasville. The price is a little bit high. They charge $80 just to do this for three hours. So please be praying for us to be able to find a place. Okay. Praise the Lord for you. Um, that's too much noise, Pastor Wooston, our Hispanic pastor. Would you like to come on here and say hi to our audience? Well, they no. can't see you. <laughs> no, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep, this is Pastor Wooston. Pray, pray for us. Yes. What do, pre, you, have, what pre, do you have pre, to pre, say? Prediquemos. <laughs> What's that mean? Let's preach. Let's preach. <laughs> Prediquemos. Let's preach. All right. So I'm going to be in 1 John this morning, chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. I love this book. I've really studied this book a lot, just like Pastor Wooston has studied Hebrews a lot. I'd really like him to teach us Hebrews in English. I'm really trying to talk him into doing that. He thinks his English is not good enough, but it is. And I think we could, I think we could learn a lot to sit under him through the book of Hebrews. I would love that. So I have really studied the book of 1 John, and I'm excited about this. And my, my greatest help in this book is Martin Lloyd-Jones, Life in Christ. He has a sermon series that's in print that you can read through this book and 2 John and 3 John. And it's really awesome, and it's really helping me a lot. And he says, he thinks that verse 6 of chapter 4, which the last message we did was how to discern truth from error, from chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. How to discern truth from error. And by the way, I really want to just make sure that you got that sermon and that you will please take that to heart. That we are to test the spirits. That means that we are to take anything we hear from any pulpit, from any preacher, from any book we read, from any preacher we listen to on the radio. We need to check them out according to the scripture and make sure that it's real and that it's truth. The Bible says, check them out. Test the spirits. But anyway, Martin Lloyd-Jones says that verse 6 of chapter 4, he thinks is kind of the end of John's teaching. And now he starts to recap everything that he said from here to the end of the book. He's going back to that great subject of love that he's already mentioned two or three times already. And by the way, that's what we're going to do this afternoon at 2.30 live on the YouTube channel Bible Truths with Kenny Coker. Go to that channel at 2.30 and I'm going to do a live presentation of a sermon recap of today's sermon. We're just going to discuss it and go over a few things. So I would invite you to come there at 2.30 this afternoon. So we come back here to this great subject of love in verse number 7, and it goes all the way down to chapter 5, verse 3. And so John has told us already that we are commanded to love one another, and uh, he's come back to that subject again last time of proving that we're really, it's a, it's a, as a test of salvation that we love one another. And now he comes in this section, verse 7, all the way down to chapter 5, verse 3, and he tells us why we should love one another. And there's really three reasons why we should love one another. And I want to divide those reasons up in three separate messages. So this week, the first reason of why we should love one another is because of the amazing love of God. So let's look at that this morning, the, why we should love one another because of the amazing love of God that's been shown to us first. So let's read it in chapter 4, verse number 7. Beloved, I'm going to try to get by this without my glasses, but if I can't, I'll put them on. They're right here. They're ready to go. Caleb told me to quit doing this, wearing them right here, because it makes my hair kind of stand up right there. And I, Nah, you don't want to hear that. All right. Anyway. <laughs> no, <I'm> kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so chapter 4, verse number 11. 
I'll put them on so we'll be safe. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, and this is why, this is the reason why, in this, the love of God was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So we're going to pray about this and uh, get, get, get out there. Let's pray about this, okay? Let's ask the Lord to help us. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would speak to us this morning. I pray that you would open our hearts. I pray that we would uh, just really take this to heart, this message, God. I pray that you would enable your servant to speak the truth in love with the boldness of the Holy Spirit and that the Holy Spirit that you would give your anointing for this time. I pray that this word would go out to many through Facebook, through YouTube, however you want to do it, through those who are here this morning and listening. May it change us forever. Oh God, we ask for your help right now. Please help us. Please rebuke the devil. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. So, um, love from the world's aspect is so much different from the love of God. The love in the world is all about feelings and emotions. And listen, feelings and emotions change. Feelings and emotions go up and down. So uh, I always tell people when you get married, don't go on just the feeling of love, but you are committing your life that you believe this is the person that God has put in your life to be your mate. You love this person, but some mornings you're going to wake up and you're not going to feel as in love, you're going to be angry sometimes at each other. And that is when the commitment of this kind of love kicks in. We're to continue to love even when we don't feel like it. It's just like our faith in Jesus. Sometimes our faith in Jesus is strong. Other days it's not as strong. But we don't go by our feelings. We go by our faith. And so I want to remind you of that this morning, that love from the world's aspect is so much different than God's love. So the Bible teaches that true agape love acts sacrificially on behalf of another person. It's not based on merely emotions. It acts even though it is not deserved. And that's missing in a lot of our churches today, and I hope to come back to that in a little bit. It's so sad to go in some churches and you can just feel the tension and you can just feel the anger. I mean, I've been in churches where people say that two ladies have not spoken to each other in years and they sit one over here and one way over there and they won't speak to each other. And you go in churches today and you go to church business meetings and there, there are arguments and people are pushing their agenda and what they want to do without seeking God, without looking, uh, seeking his glory in the decisions. And you just go in there at churches of all places. Sometimes visitors walk in churches and they get those stares like, I guess I'm not a part of this clique. And it makes them feel so uncomfortable. What's up with that? Churches should be the place, the most loving places on earth. Jesus said, this is how the world will know that you're my followers if you have love for one another. And the Apostle John wrote this book, 1 John. He's the one who wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and the book of Revelation. As I understand it, and I believe this is right, he's the only apostle who was not martyred, but died of a ripe old age. John the Apostle. And John the Apostle, you remember, is referred to as the Apostle of Love. He referred to himself, if you read John, 
John referred to himself as that disciple whom Jesus loved. He was so overwhelmed by the love of Jesus, by the love of God. Did he not write John 3.16? He did. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He also recorded the words of Jesus in John chapter 13 through 17. Just an awesome discourse of, of love. Jesus said in John 13, 35, By this shall all men know you are my disciples, if you have love to one another. John chapter 15, verse 12, Jesus said, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And so this is the third time John brings this up in this book. It's a very important truth. It's something that John really wants his people to know. It's something that we should want to know. It's something that we should decide, desire amongst each other. It's something that we should want our churches to be known for. When people come in our church, they should be overwhelmed. This place is full of love. These people are so loving. It's so different. There's a niceness and a kindness here that's so different from out there in the world. What is it? It's the love that comes from God. And so John teaches and he knows what Jesus said in John 13 through 17 that they're going to suffer persecution and you and I are going to suffer that in this world and he teaches his disciples that you're going to be rejected and you need to stick together and love one another and so uh, the first account is chapter 2 verses 9 through 11 in this book where John commands us to love one another as a test of our true salvation and then the second time he mentions loving one another is in chapter 3, verses 10 through 18. And he tells us the way we are to love one another. And now we come to this passage where he teaches us why we should love one another. And so the first part of this I want to share with you today is why we should love one another. First reason, because of the amazing love of God. Now I said this before on my sermon preview on the YouTube channel, and I'm going to say it again, Martin Lloyd-Jones said he believes that the ultimate test of our profession of the Christian faith is this whole question of our loving one another. Did you get that? Did y'all hear that? That's important. The ultimate test of how we can know that we're really saved, that we really do possess what we profess, you know, that's what this book is about. This book is all about, uh, it's, it's not just saying I'm saved. It's not just saying I love Jesus. It's not just saying I know I'm born again. John says there'll be certain marks. There'll be certain characteristics. There'll be certain fruits in your life that prove that you really are saved. And Martin Lloyd-Jones says, and I agree with him, that love, this new kind of love that's not in the world, that flows out of your heart towards others, is the ultimate test of how we can know that we're truly saved. So here's what I want us to see this morning. I want us to see two truths concerning why we should love one another because of the amazing love of God. First reason, first, first truth is, every person must realize that God is the source of love. That's why we should love one another. If we say, y'all listening this morning now, if we claim that we're saved. Do y'all know what that means? If we claim we're saved, that means that we have recognized our sinfulness. God opened our eyes. God saved us. We saw our sin. We humbled ourselves. We called on the name of Jesus. We believed in Jesus. We believe in Jesus. Jesus saved us. We're born again. We're part of God's family. Jesus, God lives on the inside of us through his spirit. He has caused us to be born again. We have a new nature. That's what it means, and that's what we're claiming if we're saved. And if we're really saved, that means we've taken on God's nature. <coughs> and God's nature is love. God is the source of love. Love is not just some mystic philosophy. Love is not found on... Days of our lives. Well, that was an old soap opera. I don't know if that's still on anymore. Love is not found in the world. Love has an origin. Real, true, self-sacrificing, 
giving love undeservingly anyway has an origin. And John traces this love to its source. Have you ever seen a creek? We used to do this when we were growing up, especially when we moved to the house that um, I lived in the second half, half of my life. There was a creek out in the woods. And uh, so as outdoorsmen, we always like, where's, where's, okay, here's a creek and here's water in the creek. There has to be a source. Where's the source of this creek? In other words, where's this water flowing from? I want to go find the source. There has to be a pond or a lake somewhere nearby that's feeding this creek. And maybe that's somewhere we can go fishing and come to find out there was a source. There was a pond close in the neighborhood. Well, John says, John says, you want to see where this kind of love, there was a song, uh, the contemporary Christian song about 25 years ago or so that was called that kind of love. Oh, where does that kind of love come from? I think was the words. Well, John says, let me show you. Let's trace love to its source. And the source, and the, God, the source is God. God is the author of love. We don't define love, God does. So, so if God is the source of love, we need to understand the nature of our Father. If we claim to be saved, then God is our Father. What is God's nature, whom we say we belong to? Well, it says in verse 7, look at it. It says it two times here. It says in verse 7 of chapter 4, Love is of God. You see it? God is the source of love. And then it says it again over in, uh, well, let's just stop right there. Let me just look at that in verse 7. Love is of God. Do you see it? Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God. The very idea of real love comes from God. Now, many of you probably know this word. It's agape. It's agape love. It's not a friendship kind of love. I can't remember the kinds of love in the Greek language. I should have made sure I knew that this morning. Philio, philio is friendship kind of love. It's not that kind of love. This is agape love. This is unconditional love. I love you no matter what. I love you when I feel like it, I love you when I don't feel like it. I love you when you're loving me back. I love you when you're not loving me back. I love you when you're being nice. It's like a parent, parental love to their children. I love you even when you're bad. I love you even when you're misbehaving. This is agape love. This kind of word used for love means to esteem highly. It is not physical or emotional love. It's not family love. It's choice love. It's to love someone in spite of what they really deserve. This kind of love only comes from God. Somebody might ask, where can I get this kind of love? Kind of like the woman at the well. Remember the woman at the well? When Jesus said, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But I can give you some living water where you'll never thirst again. She where can I get that kind of water? Well, someone might ask, where can I get that, this kind of love? Well, I'm telling you, the only place you can get it is through the Lord Jesus Christ and a relationship with God through him. You see, the Bible says love is from God. This kind of love comes from our Father. But not only does it say love is of God, that's his nature, but the Bible also says here, simply God is love. Look in verse 8, how he says it. He who does not love does not know God. Why? For God is love. And so that's what the Bible says. And it says it again in the middle of verse 16 of chapter 4. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting that John doesn't just say God loves us? God, but he says God is love. The very essence of God is love. Now that's not the only attribute of God. Some people focus just on the love of God. Well, God loves us so he wouldn't send anybody to hell. Well, we're not going there this morning, but I just want to say God is love, but God is also holy and God is also righteous. And so you can't just take one characteristic 
and just focus on that without defining all of God. But when you do define God, you define him as love because the Bible says he is love and everything he does is in love. Remember, Jesus is the son of God and we'll talk about that in just a moment. He was God, he is God in human flesh. If you go read the gospels, look at his compassion for the brokenhearted and the poor. And then look at churches today who claim to know God. Do they have that same kind of passion and brokenheartedness for the poor and the needy? I don't know. You, you be the judge of where you go to church. See his love for the blind beggar. See his love for the children. When the disciples said, you're getting on his nerves. Jesus doesn't have time for children. And Jesus said, let the little children come to me. For such belongs the kingdom of God. And he picked up a little girl and held her. See his love as he washes the disciples' feet before he goes to the cross to die for their sins and our sins. See his love when his friend Lazarus died and the Bible says he wept and they saw the great love that he must have had for his friend Lazarus. See the love of Jesus when the Bible says Jesus saw the multitudes and he had compassion on them. He felt compassion for them because they were as a sheep without a shepherd. Look with me, if you will, real quick, in John chapter 17, verses 23 through 26. Check this out. If you go over to the Gospel of John, I really want to show you something, because this is powerful. John chapter 17 and um, verse 23. Now, this is the great prayer of Jesus. And he says he's praying for us. If you look in verse 20, of John chapter 17, the Bible says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So he said, I'm not praying just for the disciples right here. I'm praying for everybody who's going to believe in me through their word. And he goes on to say in verse 23, I'm praying that I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me, watch this, and have loved them as you have loved them me. Whoa. Did y'all get that? I had to have a preacher hear a preacher preach on that for me to get that. That is saying that God loves you just like he loves his son Jesus. Think on that for a moment. That's amazing love that you have loved them, us, as you have loved me. Then he goes on to say, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them and I in them. Jesus prayed for us when he was on this earth that the love that God has for his only begotten son would be in us. That's a prayer of Jesus for us. Love is from God. God is love. That's his nature. So you know what we're saying this morning? We got to realize we should love one another because God is the source of love. And if that's God's nature, then that ought to be the nature of our family. You know, when kids are born, they take on the nature and certain characteristics of their moms and dads. You ever gotten an argument with your husband or wife? Who's the little boy acting like today? Well, he's got the Tobin nature in him today. Or he's got the Coker na nature in him today, you know. Our children take on our nature. And that's the point. If we're saved... We didn't just say a prayer and I'm saved, I'm going to heaven and live any way I want. If we're truly saved, we're born again and we're, we have a new nature. God's nature lives in us. We have to take on his nature. And God is love. And love is from God. That's what the Bible says. And so what does the Bible say? Look at verse 7. True believers. Beloved, let us love one another. Why? For love is of God and everyone who loves in this kind of way, this kind of love that comes from God, not the world, this kind of love that you can't find in the world, the kind of love I'm going to talk about in just a moment. 
Everyone who loves like this, look, what does it say? Is born of God and knows God. That's what the Bible says. If we're saved, we've taken on his nature. And the Bible says, if you see somebody loving like that, do y'all know people like that? I remember Nikki and I, and, and, and we visited another church several years ago here in Thomasville. And there was a man in that church. He is the nicest man we have ever met. He was so friendly. He was so loving. And I know others like that in the faith who just, they're just full of love for people. That doesn't come from the natural man. That comes from God. And the Bible says it very clearly. Everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. Only those born again can love like this. It's a new kind of love, and the best place to find it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Go study that chapter. That's the kind of love that this is talking about. 1 Corinthians 13, love for each other. Only those born of God can love like this. This genuine love that comes out of our hearts that people should see in our lives proclaims we are born of God. We are really children of God. We really know God. But look in verse 8. Now here's John's ever popular negative. He does this. Look in verse 8. We take on our Father's nature. Verse 6. But verse 7 says of those who are false believers, false professors, look, beloved, let us, I'm sorry, verse 8. He who does not love does not know God. Why? For God is love. So what about the person who says, I'm saved. I'm saved. But you never see any. All you see is hatefulness and meanness and spitefulness and, and talking about and criticizing. Martin Lloyd-Jones des describes them like this. I know I'm quoting him a lot. He said there are people who are unloving, unkind, always criticizing, whispering, backbiting, pleased when they hear something against another Christian. Oh, my heart grieves and bleeds for them as I think of them. They are pronouncing and proclaiming that they are not born of God. They are outside the life of God. And I repeat, there is no hope for such people unless they repent. And turn to him. So what about when you go in those churches and they're so cold and so mean-spirited and so unloving? Well, what does the Bible say? He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. Somebody says, I'm saved. We've already been through this in this book. Is there a newness in your life that you're walking in the light now? Is there a new attitude towards sin that when you sin, it bothers you? Is there a new obedience to Jesus in your life because you love him now? Is there a less love for the world? These are the tests we've been through. But ultimately, I'm saved, I'm saved. Well, is there a new love in you that people can't deny? You know, you can't deny it. Somebody gets saved and the family's not saved and they go back home and the next several weeks, the family's like, What's happened? We, we, we ran into that recently. We've ran into someone who we haven't seen in several years. And, and this guy is just super nice and super humble and just going out of his way to do things for us. I'm like, this ain't the same person we saw a few years ago. I bet this guy's got saved because that doesn't come from the world. Do you see it? Do y'all see that? It's our nature, but listen, I want to encourage us. If you're getting convicted right now, great, because I have been as I read this. Sometimes we don't always live out our new nature. Sometimes we go back to our old nature and the old man comes out, you know? Like, uh, like uh, Bodie Balkum when he's preaching, he says, when I get mad at people and they start talking about the Lord, he said, the old Bodhi wants to come out. The old man wants to come out. So um, so uh, I just want to encourage us to live out this new nature and love one another because we should love one another because God is the source of love. But then secondly and lastly, 
before we go home this morning, I want us to see why we should love one another because God has shown his love to us in an amazing way. Look with me in verses 9 through 11. Okay? And we're going to study this and look at this. Look what the Bible says. In this, verse 9, the love of God was manifested toward us. Manifested. That word means to make known in rays of light something that was hidden. Y'all see that? That's what manifested means. It means to make known something that was hidden, hidden in rays of light. God has manifested his love toward us. He's shown us his love. And listen, here's what John teaches us. God is love. God is light. And God is life. God is love. God is light. God is life. That means that God is God is love. God is light. He's absolutely holy. Now these two seem to contradict one another. Somebody says, how can God show us his love as sinners without violating his holiness? How can that be? How can See, the wrong question we ask is this, and I'm just helping y'all a little bit this morning. We ask the wrong question. Why would a loving God ever send someone to hell? That's the, that we shouldn't even be asking that question because the Bible says there's none righteous. No, not one. The right question to ask is, why would a holy God allow such a sinner like me into his presence and into heaven? That's the right question. How? How does this happen? And so here we see how God loves us and forgives us and saves us without violating his holiness. This is so awesome how God has shown us his great love. Look what God did. This is what I'm trying to show you. This is love in action. Love in action. Not just say I love you, show me you love me. Amen? Wives, it's February. Valentine's is coming up. Amen? Amen? February? It's the love month, love birds. <laughs> Wives say, husband, stop just telling me you love me and show me. They might not say it, but they think it. And that's true. But God doesn't just, the Bible doesn't just say God is love. The Bible doesn't just say God loves us. The Bible shows us what God did to love us. Now notice what the Bible says. God sent his one and only begotten son. Look in verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested, made known in rays of light, look, toward us. See it in verse 9? That God has sent his only begotten son into the world. Who did God send? His only begotten son, that's Jesus. You know what only begotten means? It means unique. The only one of his kind. And the fact that God sent him means that he existed before. None of us were sent in this world. We were born in this world. Jesus was sent. Only begotten son means that Jesus is co-equal, co-eternal with the Father. He is God, a very God. Jesus Christ is God the Son. He's everything God is. He's not an angel. Read Hebrews chapter 1. He's higher than the angels. He's God. He's not a created being. As Jehovah's Witnesses and cults will tell you, Jesus is not created. He has existed from eternity past. He's forever. He's eternal. He's not merely a great man, but he's the God man. And the Bible says in Hebrews 1 verse 6, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. Then he says in verse 8, but he didn't, in verse 7, he said of Hebrews 1, Of the angels, he saith, Who maketh his angel spirits and ministers a flame of fire. But verse 8, But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. 
John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God demonstrated his love for us in that he sent his one and only unique begotten son for us. Now here's something that's interesting. When did God send him? Now I want you to look at something here. Look with me. Look in chapter 4. I'm going to show you something. Because some people say God saved me because he knew I was a good guy. He knew I tried my best. He knew I was sincere. Mm -mm. When did God send his son? When we were looking for God and we were living for him? No. Look what the Bible says here in verse... Uh, uh, where are we at? Where are we at? Where are we? Oh yeah, verse 10. In this is love, not that we loved God. God sent Jesus when we didn't love him. Do you see that? Some people think, well, we loved God and God responded to our love. No, the Bible says he loved us when we didn't love him. Some people say, well, we were seeking God and God knew we were seeking him. No, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, there's none who seeks God. None. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we were dead in our trespasses and sins when God sent his son to save us when we didn't love him, when we were sinners. That's when God sent him. He sent to give us life. The Bible says it right here. In verse nine, he sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. So God sent Jesus when we were, when we were not loving him, when we were dead, when we were sinners. Romans chapter five, eight. Not that we loved God, when we weren't loving him, when we were enemies, the Bible says in Romans chapter 5, verse 10, that's when God sent Jesus into this world. When we were enemies, when we were sinners, when we were not loving him, we were not seeking him, and we were dead, that's when God sent Jesus. That's love, friends. And what did he do? The Bible says in verse 9, God sent him. It was all in the plan of God from eternity past, that he was going to send a savior, the Messiah, the promised one. No secret or surprise, but simply when Jesus came, it's time now. And what did he do? Where did he send him? Look at what the Bible says in verse 9 again. He sent him into the world. What kind of world did God send his son into? A world that was going to receive him? A world that was going to bow down to him? Absolutely not. The Bible says he came into his own and his own received him not in John chapter 1. The Bible says when he was a baby born as a newborn infant, there was no room for him in the inn. The Bible teaches he was born in poverty. All they had to offer for him was two turtle doves. He knew what it was to be poor. And you and I look at this world today. Now be honest, what kind of world do we live in? What kind of a messy, hating, sinful, killing, murdering, child abusing, baby killing, nasty, ugly, sinful, God-hating world we live in? And someone even told me one time, I don't want to have kids. Who wants to bring kids into this mess? But God sent his son into this world that was going to reject him for you and for me. Because look, why did he send him? And this is the amazing love of God, folks. Look at it. Look at it in verse 9. And this is the love of God. The love of God was manifested toward us. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live. Through him. God sent Jesus when we were dead in our sins so that we could have a way of forgiveness and have a way to be made alive and live forever. Look at verse 10. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us when we didn't love him and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That word we studied back in chapter 2. You know what that word means? Propitiation. It literally means wrath ending sacrifice. 
Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. We either shed our blood and we pay for our own sins, which shedding of blood means to give our life to die. So the only way we could, no animal sacrifice could pay for our sins. The only way we could pay for our own sins is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And then we still wouldn't have paid for our sins. That's why hell is forever. We'd never be able to pay our sin debt before God. But Jesus was the sacrifice, the Lamb of God, who shed his blood. He gave his life. He was punished in our place. That's the gospel, friends. That's the gospel. Jesus Jesus took all of the wrath of God and his punishment and hell in his real, literal body on the cross in six hours. Jesus bore the full wrath of God and the full punishment of hell that you and I deserve for our sins, not for his, because he never sinned. That's what propitiation is. Wow. How could God love a sinful man like me and let me into heaven? because he's so holy, but he did. And it was his choice to love us. Now friends, that's amazing love. I don't know about you, but I don't know how you're feeling right now. But uh, we ought to be kind of broken right now as we see this. Why we should love one another? Well, it proves our nature that we belong to God but ultimately because of the amazing love he showed us. We should feel so unworthy right now, convicted in our own hard, convicted of our own hardness of our hearts that we're not loving near like we should as followers of Jesus. How can we think about this? And I would encourage you to go read these verses and study this and really think about it and meditate on it and then think, Listen to me. How can we allow that hatred to stay in our hearts when we meditate on this kind of love that God showed us? The Bible says in Ephesians, we're to forgive one another even as Christ forgave us. We're to forgive each other the same way Christ forgave us. He forgave us unconditionally when we didn't deserve forgiveness and that's how we're to forgive one another. Love is the reason we can be saved from our sins, folks. Love is what motivated the Father to send his Son. Love is what led Jesus to the cross for you and me. So can we just check our motives and actions today and just ask, it's what I'm doing, it's what I'm thinking, it's what I'm saying in my everyday life driven by love, the love that comes from my Father, in the way he demonstrated it to me. And we might even ask before we go home this morning, what can I do to demonstrate the love of Christ more to others? Well, I would say, first of all, pray. Just confess to the Lord. I've not been loving like you said, Lord. Forgive me. And ask the Lord to change you and help you to start loving like this. And then there's practical ways we can do it. You can be so moved today that, you know, I'm gonna go send a note to a person. Let them know how much I love them. You know, go up to a fellow church member and just say, you know, I never, never tell you this, but I love you. I do. I thank God for you. After studying this sermon, I was moved in my heart this morning for um, the lady that came to the Hispanic service who I saw God save. And I just thought, well, I just, I just want to tell them, you know, we are so grateful for you. And, and we are so grateful that God saved you like he saved us. We just need to tell people that and ask the Lord to help us and meditate on this. And if you've been watching this sermon or you're here this morning and you're sitting there very convicted, well, I thought I was saved, but I sure, if I'm honest, I don't have this kind of love in my life. And I would just say to you, you need to be saved today and you need to ask Jesus for his forgiveness Confess your sinfulness, humble yourself before him, bow to his lordship, surrender your life to him and beg him to save you. And when he saves you, and he will if you ask him and you mean it and you believe on him, when he saves you, this love will come in your life like you've never had before and people will see it. You won't be able to hide it. 
Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the, your word. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for manifesting your love to us in that you sent your only begotten son into this world to give us life and to be the propitiation for our sins. Thank you. We love you and we ask you to help us love you more and to love each other more. In Jesus' name, amen.